Siri. Um, I'm Margaret Barron. I'm Senior Associate Dean for Physician Scientist Research Training. And um, see where, <laughs> do, we, do, I, do I need to do something to get that message out of the way? Yes, just click it on the screen. Okay. Okay. Okay, so the the um, the goal of the goal of this series is really essentially to start to uh, to build a community of uh, physician scientists at Mount Sinai, including students, trainees, and faculty, uh, to support uh, a feeling of uh, esprit de corps, to provide a venue for sharing information, ideas, and perhaps for uh, promoting collaborations, and also for providing additional sources of uh, guidance and mentoring for. Those of you who are uh, who want to incorporate research into your into your career path. So this is the the first session, which is really going to be an overview and an introduction. We have uh, four uh, three additional sessions that are scheduled so far, and we hope that this will be a monthly event. So the upcoming sessions include uh, a February February eighth session on. Finding a mentor and uh, understanding the, um, the basics of the mentor and mentee uh, 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 experience and uh, aligning expectations between mentors and mentees. Uh, on March 15th, we'll have Dr. Robert Wright speaking about, about grants, um, particularly the NIH, but other agencies as well. And then in April, we'll have Dr. Linda Damer from UCLA in a virtual session uh, talking about really over uh, talking about uh, time management um, strategies for uh, developing your career and overcoming uh, obstacles such as um, uh, procrastination and um, feelings that everything needs to be absolutely perfect so perfectionism. So um, a major takeaway from this meeting I hope will be that there are many ways to uh, to construct a successful um, our career as a physician scientist, whether or not you have a degree in addition, a graduate degree in addition to an MD degree. Um, and there are a number of paths. The, uh, one of the traditional paths is to, is to go through an MD PhD program. And that, as you know, Mount Sinai has an MD PhD program. And I directed that program for almost eight years. But there are other ways to pursue a career as a physician scientist. Many people uh, go through medical school and incorporate an additional year. So that would be the middle uh, line of this uh, diagram. So that would be MD plus in which students in medical school might do uh, one or more extra years of scholarly work and then graduate from medical school, followed by more postdoctoral training uh, in research, whether it's bench research or computational work or uh, clinical research. And then finally, other people graduate from medical school and then they pursue additional research training. And it turns out that of all NIH funded PIs who have an MD degree, almost half of those have graduated from MD PhD programs. And yet the MD PhD graduates are only 3% of medical school graduates. So there's a lot of room for MD trainees who don't have a PhD. And we need a lot of you to, uh, to decide to pursue research of different types, whether it's basic translational or clinical. And we hope that um, this, this, um, this series will, will help to stimulate some of you to do that. This slide just shows, just makes the same point that uh, MD PhD graduates pursue research in a variety of different directions. They often start with basic science research, but then they'll incorporate, often incorporate translational and patient-oriented research or go into health services. And that's true of uh, graduates from medical school who don't have a PhD. This week, we're going to be sending out a, um, uh, a needs assessment survey that will go out either tomorrow or the day after. And that will include a series of thoughts about uh, potential sessions for um, upcoming meetings, and we'd like to hear from you about what you think would be useful. And there's a box at the end for you to uh, to add your own thoughts about what kinds of sessions might be might be helpful and interesting. So we're going to have a panel discussion, and I'd like to introduce. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about our uh, our panelists today. Um, Dr. Ethan and I. Ethan, I think. 
I don't know if he raises his hand, will people see him? Yes. Yes. Okay. Ethan, maybe you can raise your hand. Uh, Dr. Abbott has a, uh, a master's in clinical research. He went through the program at Mount Sinai, and he's a new assistant professor in emergency medicine and population health. And he was a former trainee on the emergency medicine T32 training grant. Uh, Dr. Jake Lichtman, you can raise your hand. Uh, he's in his second year of a dermatology residency. He's a PhD candidate in immunology, and he's working in Dr. Emma Gutman's lab. Uh, Dr. Megan Januska, did I pronounce that right? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Januska is a new assistant professor in pediatrics, and she's a KL2 Scholar Award winner. Uh, Dr. Lauren Lippa is uh, in her sixth year of our uh, NIH, NIMH supported psychiatry residency uh, plus PhD. She's finishing up her, um, her dissertation uh, in the next year or so. Dr. Tarek Muhideen, did I pronounce yep. that correctly? Yep. Okay, he's in his second year uh, in, in the HEMONC uh, 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 fellowship, residency fellowship. And he's a graduate of our ABIM research residency uh, in internal medicine. And finally, Dr. Alex Schipper, who's a fourth year uh, resident in neurosurgery, and he recently received a grant from the Pediatric Cancer Foundation. So we can, I think we can just stop the slides now. You can see everyone. Okay. And then is, is it set up so that as people talk, they'll I'll be able to hear them. Okay. Okay. So um, maybe we could start by having each one of you briefly tell us, um, uh, just tell us a little bit about your career path. How you, at what point did you get interested in in research, whether it was high school, undergraduate, or later? Um, and um, and then we'll take it from there. So maybe we'll start with you. Ian. Oh sure. Uh, yeah. Th thanks so much for the opportunity to be here. Yes, I think I took a little bit more of a non-traditional I'm, I'm sorry i completely forgot <laughs> eric I, I think before we go on to to the to the um panelists i'd like to introduce uh dr michael lightman who's the dean of graduate medical education um and dr eric nessler who's the dean for academic affairs and the um that's what, what is your that's enough yeah. <laughs> okay so um maybe you could give dr lightman the I just wanted each one of you to, to say a little bit um, about um, physician scientist training at Mount Sinai. Thank oh, you. Dr. Lightman, you have to move along. I got it. Can can they hear me on Zoom by speaking to this? Yeah, I, got, I mean they're looking back. at your back. This, so. this room is really not good for uh, hybrid. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So well, for those of you that I see in three dimensions, <laughs> good evening. And for those of you that are up on the screen, uh, Thank you all. Thank you all for joining. Really, it's, it's a pleasure to see all of you. It's been a while since I've seen some of you, but I'm thankful that you're here. Thank you, Dr. Barron, for really adding a dimension to Mount Sinai's uh, GD program. Uh, I'm really interested to hear what our, our panelists are going to uh, share with us, and I'm really grateful that, that all of you have joined us to uh, take a, a little bit of a segue away from clinical medicine and speak about science, which is something that's really important to, to all of us. I think it's really important to our school. And uh, we're grateful that you're uh, that you're joining us this evening. And I'll hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Eric Nestler. Dr. Nestler, great. Thanks, Mike. Do I need the microphone in order for them to hear me on Zoom? Try without the microphone. Oh. Can people hear me okay on? Oh, we'll never know. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> can hear. You got a thumbs up. Right, great. So listen, it's it's really a pleasure to be here today. Um, I've been in Mount Sinai for about 15 years. And uh, my feeling has been since getting here is that we have been on a tear. The trajectory of Mount Sinai is really amazing. We've doubled our NIH funding in the last seven or eight years alone. We've risen in the rankings. We're doing really, really well. But frankly, from where I sit, my diagnosis is we don't have nearly as many physician scientists mm -hmm. as we should. And I think that's partly because of where we are in our developmental history as a relatively new medical school, only 50 years old or so, or the hospital is much older, med school is new. And I think we are now finally at the point where we can invest in developing an army of physician scientists. I think that's essential for the future of American medicine and for Mount Sinai in particular. 
I'm an MD PhD graduate many, many years ago. I did a research track residency in psychiatry. And having that research track, having research embedded in my residency training was essential for me to launch my academic career. And what we would like to do here at Mount Sinai is to make research opportunities available to residents and fellows to a far greater extent than we've done historically. That's not only for MD PhDs, but as Margaret emphasized, most research by MDs is by MDs that don't have a PhD, right? So we wanna embrace everyone, every physician who wants to get active in research, from basic research to clinical research, uh, health services research, computational research, and so on. The way we think is to do that optimally is to have all y'all get involved in research programs that are specific for you, for you. We don't want you to be a traditional five or six year postdoc in a PI's lab. There's no way that that's feasible given where you are in your clinical training. We want you to go into a lab, benefit from having a PI as mentor, but then craft a research program that belongs to you, that you can take as your own and develop into as rapidly as possible into a K award or a related type of grant and launch your careers. It's something that some of us know how to do really, really well. Some departments at Mount Sinai have done it well historically. One of the goals that Margaret Barron has and with Mike's strongest support is to really now intercalate that across the entire medical center so that every department uh, and clinical training program at Mount Sinai will foster research accordingly. One last point. My career as a physician scientist has been one getting used to transitions. Those of you who are MD PhDs, I think will know what I mean by that, constantly going back and forth between medicine, research, medicine, research, which can feel like whiplash at times. The hardest of many transitions that I had was to get back into research when I was a resident. And I came from a very strong platform of having a PhD, and still I found it extremely difficult during my PG3 year when I actually had to go back to the lab, start pipetting again, right? It was, it, 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 I could still remember how traumatic it was for me to start using techniques that were almost like um, wrote, you know, uh, a subconscious memory for me. And it was still a real, a real difficult transition. So we are committed, Mike and Margaret and I, to providing the mentoring and support that you all needed to make that transition. Right. We really want to see this happening. So I can't wait to see what you all hook up with this new program. Congratulations on the new series. And we really are hoping that it takes root. And I'm available to any of you at any time. Please feel free to send me an email if, you, if you'd like to hear more. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, now we can start the, with the panel. I don't need the mic. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks so much for the invite. Uh, so my name is Ethan Abbott. I'm one of the um, uh, faculty in the Department of Emergency Medicine. Um, and uh, I guess maybe my my sort of research trajectory is probably a little bit different maybe than other people here. I'm not sure. But um, yeah, so essentially I came straight out of residency and worked clinically for several, several years and then got sort of interested in epidemiological and health services research and realized that I really couldn't conduct it in any sort of tangible way without Further training. So I did. I came to Mount Sinai. I uh, was really interested in the T32 uh, research program in emergency care that is uh, run by Dr. Lynn Richardson and Alex Manini, and that kind of gave me the opportunity to sort of build the, the foundation I needed. So about three years ago, I um, started that, as well as completed a master's in clinical research here. And my focus has been on really health services epidemiological research, looking at. Um, out of hospital cardiac arrest and uh, focus on, focusing mainly on disparities uh, and health equity. Um, and that's just kind of kind of a brief introduction of where I've gotten from or where I've or come to. Um, I think one thing that if I was going to make any suggestions, I think the, the early struggles in fellowship for me at least were kind of securing 
the right mentor and sort of getting on that that initial pathway. And the one sort of thing that sort of lifted me up, I think, was uh, acquiring my first you know grant funding. It was a small amount of money, but I think it really uh, really kind of changed everything for me and made me realize what I was doing was was pretty exciting and important. So, but I'll pass it over. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you so much for including me in today's series. Uh, it's an honor to be a part of such a wonderful group of uh, panelists as well as people here. Uh, so my background is a little bit different. I ended up actually going to med school at Sinai through FlexMed's early admission program. And for those that don't know what that is, that's where you can get at, uh, you kind of excuse yourself for some of the traditional requirements of medicine to pursue um, other opportunities. So for me, that was computer science and bioinformatics. So during college, I spent a lot of my time uh, pursuing research in bioinformatics and then ended up getting a master's in bioinformatics as well. And then ultimately uh, got involved in research um, almost fortuitously during medical school. I think I bumped into who now is a faculty member here, uh, Dr. Benjamin Unger, who said how it, the lab just needed a bioinformatician and I didn't really know much about it. I didn't realize bioinformatics was useful at that time to anyone outside of college. Uh, turns out it ended up being a little useful. And um, I kind of just fell into this lab and really enjoyed my time in the dermatology lab. And what I ended up realizing, the more clinical exposure I got as the years went on in medical school and ultimately in residency, is that there is so much, um, I guess it's, it's really amazing to see just a little bit of the gap between what you see in the lab and then what you see in the clinic. So especially in dermatology, there's just been a huge revolution in therapeutics and it made me want to be a part of it. So I ended up applying into uh, the graduate schools uh, biomedical sciences PhD a little bit later during my fourth year. And now I've been incredibly lucky to be in a residency in dermatology at Mount Sinai where they're working with me to pursue this PhD in immunology. And they're kind of designing um, this physician uh, PhD in residence uh, in the dermatology department where you can carve out time to do research. Um, you have a large percentage of time during various portions of your training to do research and then ultimately uh, and probably end up taking a couple of years um, beyond the residency to do research here as well. So a little bit of a roundabout journey, but I am grateful to be here. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you as well for uh, inviting me to be part of the panel. Uh, so I would say um, everything started with me uh, as a, since you asked about how everything started. Uh, it was as a kid, actually, I always wanted to be a scientist first. Uh, that's what I used to think about all the time. And um, oncology cancer was my um, interest. Uh, and then um, one thing that would be different for me is that I'm actually an international medical graduate. So I uh, was in Lebanon and I went to undergrad and medical school over there. Um, and the difference between there and here is that the like research isn't really integrated into medical school like uh, it is here in some medical schools. Um, so uh, back then, even when I was in medical school, I really wanted to be part of research projects and I was interested in the lab side of things rather than clinical. And I, I must say that uh, as a first year medical student going to the labs and uh, in our medical school, um, asking for research projects or to actually start in a lab, I wasn't taken too seriously because they all thought that, oh, I'm going to bail out because oh, medical school is going to keep you busy. But I ended up actually doing research from first year medical school till I graduated, um, was able to have a lot of um, research projects published. Um, and actually that really helped me uh, find a postdoc research fellowship uh, after medical school. Um, so in my last year of medical school, I wanted to um, get more research experience somewhere here in the US because I wanted to have even more exposure, learn more techniques. Um, so that's how I ended up actually uh, doing a three-year research fellowship at Dana-Farber. I worked in a multiple myeloma lab over there. And um, when I was there, I actually uh, became super interested in multiple myeloma. Uh, before going into the lab, I really wasn't sure which 
uh, part of the oncology field I wanted to go in. I was just applying to different oncology labs. Um, I got the opportunity in a Paloma lab, went in, did the basic science part, but also joined my PI in clinic as well once a week. So I got to see both sides of things. And that's when I found out that I'm interested in multiple myeloma for sure. Um, and after that, I applied for residency and I really focused on finding a program that offers the physician scientist track. Um, because I knew for sure that I wanted to stay in academia, be a physician scientist, and I wanted to just keep growing um, towards that career path. Um, and I must say that out of all um, the programs that I interviewed at for residency back then, um, Sinai uh, was like my top choice and actually was my number one choice because one thing that I really liked that differentiated Sinai from other um, residency programs was that when I interviewed here, I felt that all the faculty that actually interviewed me um, were really interested in research and invested in actually growing physician scientists, um, even though they were interviewing me for an internal medicine position. And as a resident, you're uh, expected to basically do clinical duties in the hospital, and that's what they really care about, or, uh, usually. I felt that they really gave a lot of uh, weight to what I did um, in the research uh, field. And that's not something I um, saw in a lot of the programs I interviewed that. So I really appreciated that. And that was like a main driver for me choosing Sinai uh, for my residency. And um, as uh, you know, the physician scientist track for residency is two years rather than three for medicine. So uh, I did that and now I'm in fellowship. Um, my residency time was busy, mostly because it was during COVID. So um, that was a busy time, uh, but I still managed to do some clinical projects, even though my interest is usually going to the lab. Uh, it, it's not possible as a resident to be productive in a lab. Um, so I did some research projects, was involved with uh, my Loma team here. Uh, I worked with them and that created a very smooth transition into fellowship uh, when I became a fellow. Um, so I, I'm a second year right now. I just finished uh, all my clinical duties as a fellow uh, because our fellowship is 50-50, uh, 50, 50, 50 clinical, 50 research. So, um, and I asked that all my clinical duties be stacked first half of a uh, fellowship so that uh, once I'm done, I actually go into the lab and keep going and actually be productive rather than going back and forth between clinical duties and lab. Um, so I chose uh, the lab of Dr. Samir Parikh. Very excited to uh, start working with him. I mean, I've been working with him on clinical projects, but now I'm going to be at the bench side. Uh, my interests are mainly the tumor microenvironment, immunology, and immunotherapies. Um, a lot of translational focus because I like the bridge between the clinic and the lab. Um, but I, I guess, like, in addition to all the projects I'm looking forward to, I, this is the time where I'm now seriously thinking about uh, applying to grants. And that is also my next step, which I must say I'm getting a lot of support for and a lot of mentorship. And um, I feel very confident that at some point I'll be able to secure a funding because of all the resources I have around me here. Maybe we can come back to that and just want to give everybody yeah. a chance to. Um, introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. My name is Megan. Uh, for all those of you who are intimidated by everyone's extra training and extra degrees, I've done none of that. <laughs> um, and I'm still sitting in front of you. So I didn't really think I wanted to do research until pediatric residency. Uh, the residency here offers a pediatric resident uh, scholarship, which is a small nominal sum, relatively small, to do research during residency. So I was awarded that and started research there. I stayed for my pediatric pulmonary fellowship um, and knew that I enjoyed my brief time in the lab and residency and wanted to continue that. Um, I was interested in cystic fibrosis clinically. So I found a mentor that could mentor me in that disease state um, who had only done research on adults. So I had a new vantage point 
and was able to successfully compete for a Cystic Fibrosis Foundation Clinical Fellowship Award um, and leverage the workflow that I developed during fellowship to apply for my KL2, which I'm working on now. Um, so I'm a direct med school residency fellowship attending and am seemingly successful this year. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lauren. Um, it's so great just to hear your other stories. I didn't know there was another resident who's getting a PhD, so I feel like we have a lot to talk about. Um, but yeah, so I always was involved in research starting in high school and college, um, but my mentors who were MDs in college told me that you didn't need a PhD to do research, so no need to apply to any PhD. Um, so kept doing research through med school, but realized towards the end of med school that I, I had worked in kind of all these different labs and didn't know like my through line, didn't know, didn't feel prepared to be in a residency that I'd be able to go become an independent researcher. I had no idea how residency would allow me the time to do that even in research tracks. Most people applying for research tracks in psychiatry had PhDs. Um, and so then I, Mount Sinai has this incredible unique program that psychiatry residency and a PhD you can choose in neuroscience or a couple other fields, epigenetics. And so that sounded fun. Um, and it's seven years. I'm currently in my sixth year. Um, so the the idea, part of the idea of the program is that you choose um, your research area of specialty after you've already established a clinical interest. Um, and so that's really what happened for me. I knew I wanted to do something with novel therapeutics, had worked there before, something translational, maybe clinical. Um, and then just working with patients the first couple of years of residency, I really knew I wanted to work with trauma and um, also became extremely interested in psychotherapy. And I feel like Mount Sinai is, and in New York and Mount Sinai are so unique in that you can still develop clinical interests. Um, so I've taken all these additional psychotherapy training programs, see psychotherapy patients, um, while still being, a, you know, seriously, obviously research takes a lot of time and commitment and you can really do both. Um, so yeah, I've had all this time to, you know, take the neuroscience classes. They've really tailored it to fit into my residency schedule. The residency has been amazing about accommodating that with call and everything. Um, and then um, started, um, so when I, I guess during PGY2, um, I realized that I really wanted to work in the psychedelic center, which at that time, I guess, was just an idea. Um, but met my now mentor, Rachel Yehuda, who has had this idea that she wanted to use psychedelics assisted psychotherapy to treat PTSD. And um, that, for so many reasons, kind of combined this scientific interest, novel therapeutics, psychotherapy, and felt like a really good fit for me. Um, but I didn't know what, like, I was going to pursue for my neuroscience PhD. It's, like, it's um, the, the clinical trials are mostly clinical. Um, and so then that's when I got really exposed to, like, the playground that is Mount Sinai Psychiatry and Neuroscience. And so I just got to like go knock on doors um, of all these PIs in psychiatry and they were super cool. And there's just like amazing things going on. And they also were just really welcoming, which I was surprised about because like I didn't necessarily have a lot of experience in a particular field, but I had a lot of, I guess, time, which a lot of people don't have, but time and interest. Um, and they, everyone was extremely, yeah, just opened their doors and offered resources and training. Um, and so at first I landed in a neuroimaging lab, um, which, and I, I didn't do lab rotations because I didn't think I had time, which was silly. Um, I landed in a neuroimaging lab, thought it would be a nice skill for a clin clinician to have. Um, but then COVID happened and I started realizing I really, the more I learned about neuroimaging, I realized it actually wasn't a good fit, didn't know what to do. Um, and then during COVID, kind of joined this task force that became the COVID Biobank, um, led in part by Alex Charney, and discovered this world of um, bioinformatics, data science, natural language processing, and like how a clinician can really be helpful um, in, uh, in that translational piece. Then so like realized that I really wanted to apply natural language processing tools, data science to psychiatry, to psychotherapy, and all of my mentors are extremely gracious in, in allowing me to switch from neuroimaging to data science. Um, and so now, yeah, I'm um, finishing up my dissertation in 
um, Alex Chinese lab while still involved in the clinical trials and psychedelics as a therapist and investigator. And so I feel like I just really get to do all of these different things, psychotherapy, clinical research, um, data science research that I didn't think like could all be possible, but uh, that are very me and like on a day-to-day -day basis, like today I get to do like all of those different things and see psychotherapy patients. Um, so yeah. Thank you. Cool. I'll try to keep it short since I want to give you guys time for questions. Um, I'm the only surgeon on this panel, so I'll try to give kind of the surgeon's perspective or perspective of someone who has a set longer residency. I know Lauren has made hers longer, but um, I came in knowing it was going to be seven years. Um, so I actually started medical school debating for a week of doing MD PhD, and then I did the quick math and realized what age I was going to be after nursery residency, doing MD PhD, and quickly. Uh, Scrap that. But on a more serious note, I was very confident with the lab experience I had in college and then subsequently in med school. Um, I went to UC San Diego, which was a very strong neuroscience program, as some of you may know. Um, so I was confident that even without being in the MSDP track, I could still get the lab skills that I wanted to, to do what I wanted to do. Um, unfortunately, in a specialty like neurosurgery, there are a lot of prolific surgeon scientists who just have MDs. So I really had a clear track to follow. I wasn't really going to be trailblazing by any means. And doing things that my mentors told me I couldn't do. So I think that was really the path of least resistance for me, at least. Um, what's nice from a, a surgeon's perspective is when you're in training, as you guys know, we have longer residencies. So there's more of an innate ability to really weave yourself into a, a, a research track. It's not like a short program where you have to extend it by double the length or something like that. So um, it was really easy for me and pretty seamless because when I was applying to neurosurgery, uh, the AC, ACGME changed the rule that every program had to be seven years. So every program had a minimum of 12 months of dedicated elective time. So that was really nice. I didn't, didn't really have to fight for it, which as an applicant is, is really a luxury um, that I appreciate later on. Um, I'd say the two things I've really learned that I try to tell to some of our junior residents or med students who I met or is uh, the, two, the two major uh, components that I've really picked up over the years so far, because I'm only halfway through my training, are mentorship and momentum. Uh, mentorship is definitely key, having people who really paved the way that in terms of envisioning a career like yourself, I think is really important. Um, right now, I work at Orrin Becker's lab, who in my mind really epitomizes the ability of having a very successful lab without being an MD, PhD. Um, he's really trailblazed the way for DIPG, which is the branch that we say in our lab. So having mentorship like that and seeing a track kind of going through your trajectory, even though he's a different specialist than I am, I think is really important. And then momentum is, is a huge key. Um, even in a program like neurosurgery, where as a junior resident, you're not often afforded a lot of time to spend dedicated research, just being labeled as the research resident or a resident who's willing to take advantage of research opportunities, I think is key. Um, I'll give you an example. So halfway through my intern year was COVID. And so essentially all of the like, lab opportunities shut down for us. And so even though we have three months of elective time, my time quickly shifted to Q3 call working with COVID patients, which I was not expecting when at the beginning of the year, I was anticipating being in a lab. And instead of that, um, well, you know, instead of just scrapping the research opportunity, I found uh, some interesting research opportunities around COVID in neurosurgery patients. And that led to a couple of publications. I ended up working with attendings who I previously hadn't done research with. And that just kind of snowballed into further opportunities. Um, we say the most random things for, for example, some of the neurological sequelae that pediatric patients in the PICU got uh, who were neurosurgical patients, um, kind of like the sers like syndromes, for example. And so we started publishing on things like that. Our department um, under Jay Mako published a lot on COVID-related strokes, aneurysms, et cetera, even published in New England Journal of Medicine on this. Um, so just having a track record of being someone who's willing to take on these research opportunities is key. And then when later on, when I was finally able to take advantage of elective time, it re really wasn't difficult to try to convince my program director and my chairman that um, you know, I wanted to do a decade year doing bench lab research, doing more basic science research. I didn't have the opportunity during junior years, but had I not been productive as a junior resident doing more, taking advantage of more clinical opportunities, I wouldn't have been afforded the same opportunities um, that I had. Um, for example, I came into the year applying for NREF. Unfortunately, I didn't get it. But I was still given the opportunity because I had proven the track record of being productive from a research standpoint. So even though I failed at getting that specific grant, I was still given the opportunity by my mentors, by my chairman, my, my program director, just because I had really proven 
that I was capable of doing the research. And I think that starts early. And if I try and tell at least to like your insurance engineer residents is even if you're doing something not very impactful, right? You're just publishing a case report or something lower impact, you know, just proving that you have a track record of being able to complete projects, get your name on papers, help people out, work as a team, you're really establishing that name for yourself. And so by the time you come up and you want to do more impactful stuff, people are going to hand you those opportunities and really it just snowballs. So I think momentum and mentorship are really the two things I've taken away so far. So thank you. I think um, from the six stories we've just heard, it's very clear that there are many different ways to craft a successful career. All six, all six of you are very successful. And it's also clear that having a mentor or mentors is absolutely critical. So um, I won't go one by one again, but I wonder if, if any of you would like to comment on how you go about looking for a mentor and what do you look for in a mentor? Um, I mean, uh, the first thing I look for, for definitely is pretty obvious, having similar interests. That's number one. Um, no, um, and I always, I've definitely had several mentors over the, over the years, and a lot of them are, I would still consider them mentors. I still reach out to them. I still talk to them and ask for advice. Um, I would say I always tend to find someone who's not too early in their career and not necessarily too senior. Some, sometimes I'd like to find someone in the middle because I feel like they have, they, at that stage, they have enough experience to teach. And at the same time, they're not too busy to um, actually create time for you. Um, and the second thing I would look for is um, like success stories from that specific uh, mentor like I, I would look at the past trainees that have worked with that person and what have what they've accomplished and where they are right now um and depending on that that's how I start like uh looking for uh, a specific mentor and trying to decide if that would be the best person for me I think it depends on what type of mentorship you're looking for. Like if you're looking for a career mentor that looks like a certain thing, or if you're looking for a mentor to learn a new skill that looks like another thing. And that might also look like seeing what postdoc they have, um, who's going to be readily available to teach you all the time. Um, so yeah, I, I think I didn't realize at the beginning that those are very different things, like having a clinical mentor, which is really important too, who understands that research needs to fit into your life. Um, and then having someone who can see more big picture, who maybe is more hands off, but you can still publish papers with or like learn about career opportunities and then having like a more technical person. I mean, not that you need all of those all the time, but they're very different. Yeah, I would, I would agree with Lauren. I think, I think you know, I, I came into research sort of idealistic thing. There'd be like one mentor sort of that would help me along the way but i think you, each mentor sort of serves a different role for you like 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 lauren was saying like you almost have a like a career development mentor a content area mentor a clinical mentor and i think you know i have nightmares when i go to bed that my main mentor is going to like disappear or something and i wake up the next morning and have nobody to help me but that's not the case because i think in reality you have you know several mentors you know at different levels and stages in their career and they i think each contribute something important to advancing your 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 research uh, objectives and then just to add on for those of you who might be going into a lab that's run by a phd it's really good to either have a clinical mentor or someone who's advocating for your time that understand what clinical residency is like or what clinical fellowship is like because the expectations are going to be very different so unless you set that expectation in the beginning and have someone who can advocate for you through your program, it's going to be a little bit more challenging. So finding that like person, whether it's your fellowship director, your residency director, or somebody in the clinical faculty that can keep advocating for you, it's going to be to your benefit. Any other comments? Okay, well, um, I could keep asking questions, but I'd like to give um, some of the uh, members of our audience an opportunity to ask questions uh, before I continue. So do we have questions from anybody in the audience here or online? Oh, actually, Dr. Barron, I would like to test 
Um, Dr. Sorio, I see that you are logged on. I want to see if we have our folks who are logged in, if we can hear your questions in the room. So Dr. Sorio, do you mind just unmuting um, just for a moment, just to see if we can hear your voice? Yes, sorry, I have the video off. I'm at West uh, on service, but yes, can you hear me? We can, that is perfect. Okay, so thank folks you. folks who are joining us uh, virtually, if you would like to unmute yourselves and um, pose a question, please do so. Any questions from anybody in here? Yes. So I was wondering, and I'm so sorry, maybe we'll pass right. this down. It's hard to hear you. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about the uh, clinical research masters, I think, that you were discussing and um, how you can like incorporate that into a clinical schedule and how that helps you in your research pursuits. Yeah, so the master's in clinical research here at least is um, really focused, I, I think, more heavily on clinical trials. Um, so just with that in mind. But um, yeah, the way that it was designed uh, for the curriculum, at least for our program, was we did the master's during the T32 fellowship. So at that time, it was only 50% clinical. So in emergency medicine, that would be about five, 600 clinical hours. Um, so I was able to talk with our scheduler about working sort of scheduling shifts around uh, courses and things like that. But it, it definitely was um, challenging to, you know, to try to balance all that stuff out. But it's, it's, it's very, very possible and doable to, to complete the master's um, while working clinically. Maybe full time would be a little bit harder, but yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I was wondering how you navigated the process of uh, getting a grant, what your experience was like, uh, maybe if, if you had experience with that. So, I mean, just to you know, keep echoing my own uh, getting just like mentorship and momentum, I think is everything. So, um, I started off my original mentor in nurse surgery was a nurse surgeon who actually just moved to Pittsburgh this year, uh, who I started in his lab this year. and. Uh, starting two years ago, he started to include me on industry grants, like smaller private grants through th some of the technologies we use in the operating room, just to help with the grant writing process. You'll learn very quickly if you have written grants before. It's a whole other skill set. It's not like writing a clinical paper or a basic science paper. It's a whole new, it, it really almost needs like its own masters for understanding how to read grants, write grants, et cetera. And it really made me appreciate by working on these smaller grants what it takes to work toward an NIH grant, which is eventually the goal, right, for a lot of us. Um, so I think it's just practice. It, it's a little harder to get into it because you can't just go and pop ahead and start reading grants, right, like you would with papers. But um, I think just starting early and you know finding your research mentors and asking them to see their most recent grants, like if they have an R01, can I see your R01? You know, can I just look at the different drafts you have to see what worked, what did it? Um, and to see the language and the formatting of grants. And so um, this year when I started in the Orrin Becker's lab, we worked on a B-plus foundation grant for a new project. And uh, fortunately we were awarded it, but it took a lot of handholding in the beginning and seeing some of Dr. Becker's other grants to really understand what it takes to be successful at grant writing. So I think at least in the beginning, like at, at least at my stage in training, I really need strong mentorship in terms of like understanding what grant writers with the skills that they need and what reviewers are looking for. And then when you become more senior, you're really adapting those skills. But at least I think probably at our stage, it's really nice to have close mentorship with that because it's not just a skill that comes innately, like some of their skills in medicine. Um, so I've actually found Sinai to be a great place to apply for grants. Um, at least speaking from a pediatrics perspective, our pediatrics department has an internal grant that they award to four or five residents or fellows every year for $10,000, which is enough to get you started. The Minutes Child Health Institute has their own grant funding for internal awards for trainees. I think neuroscience does. I'm not sure who else does, but I would look for those opportunities because they tend to be smaller grants, but they're formulated in ways that mimic like what a kid would look like, but on a much smaller scale. Um, so I was awarded one of those, which is my first handing grant writing. And then in fellowship, um, 
I look for smaller foundational brands are probably the easiest ones to get. And there are brands that are designed specifically for fellows. Um, so depending on what area of specialty you're interested in or disease state, they tend to look to those foundations. So the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation was great. They want to get physician scientists into the pipeline. So they're offering a lot of opportunities for fellows. They're not as competitive as the NIH grants. Um, and then going through that process helps set me up for my next process. Um, I'll also say that if you look for emails, there was a, a workshop on how to apply for a K that I took when I was a fellow that was online. So there's a lot of opportunities here. You just have to kind of read some of those broadcast emails that I think some of us tend to ignore from time to time. Um, and talk to their mentors about what institutes they're in, whether they have their own trainee grants, which I think a lot of them do, and what opportunities are here for you locally to start small. Yeah, I would, I would agree with what Alex said. I think grant writing is like a daunting process, and once you start doing it, it's it's very painful. So I actually acquired funding through a small foundation, Mercy Medicine Foundation, for a health disparities grant. That was my first successful grant. And then if you get into research, you can also apply for the NIH LRP, which is the Loan Repayment Program grant, which is um, not super competitive, but it does require you to, to write a pretty decent grant, and I also got that. And then I just submitted my NHLBI K08 uh, Career Development Award. So um, I think, you know, you early on, you have to look for, you know, these small little grants. And it, it requires so much time to write a grant. I think, you know, my K08, I probably spent a year and a half writing the AIMS page. And then, you know, more than four or 500 hours just writing the grant itself. So I think, you know, it's it's just a really unusual kind of writing that I had never done before. And I think, you know, trying to start early in practice and get a, get a sense for, you know, what, um, you know, granting organizations are looking for, because um, I don't think it, I don't think it's anything like, you know, I have no skill set I've ever, you know, had before, or any kind of writing uh, style of writing I've done before. So, so I, yeah, I would say that's probably one of the most challenging things uh, that I've, I've faced in the last at least year or so. There's a question. Okay, great. Uh, Ram, you can unmute. Ram, can you hear me? You can unmute and ask your question. Hello. Hello, are you able to hear me? Yes, you're a little low, but we can hear you. Hi, um, hi. my name is Ram. I'm a PEDS resident. I'm currently in the PQ, so that's why I couldn't join in person. Um, so my question was, I am an IMG, um, and in as an international medical grad, uh, we go into med school right out of high school. So we don't get much of a chance to like, you know, do a bachelor's course where we get opportunity, opportunities to build our basic science research skills or um, opportunities to develop any prior exposure in a STEM field. We, so for someone who is realizing, so I realized through med school that I'm interested in research and then I moved on to residency and I'm here and I find it, I'm finding it hard to uh, really display the skills that I feel, I think are required for someone who uh, wants to pers pursue a physician scientist track. So I was wondering if someone could talk about how to build those skills to pursue like basic science research or translation, translational research. Does anyone want to tackle that? Not I would say the most important thing is for you to figure out what you're interested in. And then once you have a sense of what you're interested in, start meeting with people who are working in those general areas and see if any of them has an opportunity for you to either join a lab or work on an ongoing project and take it from there. It's, you won't be able to, um, to do everything all at once, but if you take it step by step, uh, that that's what I would recommend. Other questions? Just a general question. Um, for people who don't have a PhD or a master's, what would you recommend for um, kind of some basic statistical education? I know there was a statistics, like a biostack program um, here at Sinai previously that wasn't like a full master's. I 
take a shot at this. Um, most of my work is actually, I transitioned to doing more sort of informatics and data science stuff uh, from traditional statistics and frequentist statistics, whatever you want to call it. So um, I would say it's really hard to sort of teach yourself some of that stuff and sort of do it independently. Um, I don't have any specific suggestions, unfortunately, like courses or things like that. But I, I do think if you can sort of find a formal program, it, it, it just... It, it benefits you a lot. I think trying to do, trying to, especially when you take what that knowledge and try to apply it to, you know, some sort of uh, data set, it gets really, really messy. So, you know, trying to trying to set up a self learning plan through some sort of online course can be challenging. It can be done. I mean, it certainly can be done. But I think if you can't find a course, you know, that's that has formal instruction and and maybe even like a mentor, I think that would be my recommendation. Unfortunately. There are also some summer programs that are offered through, I know like University of Washington has one that I think is four to six weeks. So if you plan enough ahead of time, you could do that as part of your elective or whatever extra time you have. Um, and then if you just need to get started with statistics for a project, there are a lot of walk-in statistic, um, like stat chat. Um, and I think some departments have their own statisticians that you can work with to at least get started. And depending on what level of statistics you need, they might be able to either help walk you through it so you can learn some of those skills or point you in the right direction of specific trainings. Trevor, we see your hand up. You can unmute and ask your question. Uh, hi, it was not so much a question, but just a, a, a plug for the previous question that was asked. Um, if you're interested in learning uh, statistics, biostatistics, and R specifically. Um, I uh, did not have any background in that, um, even really during my PhD, but um, during my time in residency with Alex, um, used a website with a, a professor from the University of Michigan called Riffamonas, um, R-I-F-F-O-M-A-N-A-S. Uh, I'll put a link in the chat. But it's a really excellent code club that gets into utilizing R for data science, specifically biological data science, and handling um, data both from a visualization standpoint as well as just analysis. Alex and I have um, uh, published um, and are in the process of publishing some large uh, national inpatient sample databases based off of code that I wrote with this. So um, really helpful and uh, would recommend it highly. Great. Do we have other questions? Are there other questions uh, in the chat? Okay, let's see. Um, uh, let me ask a different ki kind of question. Um, would any of you like to comment on networking, the importance of networking, and how you go about doing it? And at what stage of your training do you do it? Sorry, I'm a broken record. Uh, uh, I don't think there's a bad time to network. I feel like most people in this room would agree. Um, I think networking looks differently depending on where you want your career, whether you're, you're looking for a fellowship slot, you're looking for a job, you're looking to be promoted, et cetera. Um, but networking is incredibly important. I mean, I can't stress enough how, how much my career has developed just by attending national conferences, going to meetings, giving plenary talks, et cetera. Um, just establishing collaborations with different universities, being part of different um, multi-institutional registries. I mean, a, a significant amount of my academic um, progress has come from this. So uh, I'd say any opportunity, I mentor med students both here and at my um, alma mater, but um, I always emphasize like any chance you have to go to any conference, even if it's just like a Mount Sinai conference where, you know, other professors from other institutions in New York City are coming, like take advantage of it even just like melting of the minds and hearing different perspectives is so important. Um, I know in our lab, we're meeting with um, pediatric oncologists at, at Columbia, MSK, et cetera, and just hearing their perspectives and how different labs do things, you'll learn so much. Um, so there, there's really no downside. Um, I definitely second that. Conferences have been like my number one uh, go-to for networking, and it has led actually to a lot of 
collaborations and projects and publications. Just like I remember one where I just um, um, went up to one of um, the faculty from Cornell. I saw him at Ash, which is one of the conferences we attend for uh, heme disorders, and um, I just discussed one idea with him. Um, and that led to a discussion and actually eventually a project, a collaboration between two institutions and a publication. And it just started from just like an idea that we just, I just talked about with him. So uh, definitely conferences is number one. Um, second that I've been resorting to, which is surprising to some people, is Twitter. Um, Met Twitter right now is uh, uh, a hot thing. Um, I've definitely had a lot of connections uh, made through Twitter, um, even have started projects because of that, like um, people that, I mean, they're known, but I've never talked to before or seen in real life have reached out to me on Twitter. And we've started things just by that. Um, and lastly, um, I would advise everyone never to be shy to ask your mentors for connections and networking. Like I've definitely, I have multiple mentors and I've definitely went to each and every one and uh, asked them to introduce me to, to certain people or to start a collaboration or anything. And that has definitely led, always led to something. Um, I highly advise people to do that too. Follow up, people. Um, in terms of your comment about uh, partnering with someone from an outside institution, do you feel like it's reasonable or harmful or valuable, I guess, to have a mentor from an outside institution when you're just starting out? Or do you think it's important to find someone within Sinai? Um, it's definitely not a bad idea to have a mentor outside the institution, but um, I think it's always easier to start within your own institution. It's just uh, easier, smoother, and more efficient. Um, and definitely having someone outside will I don't, I personally don't see a downside to it. It's always going to be beneficial. It's definitely helped me like when I deal with uh, people outside, but um, it's definitely easier and it's going to maybe push you at a faster rate if you have someone inside for sure. I'd like to add to it. Keep in mind, it may not be obvious, but as you as your career progresses, the people you meet outside of the place where you train, and when they get to know your work and they get to know you, those are people who are going to be able to write letters for you for all sorts of opportunities, whether it's fellowships or jobs or awards. So the more people you get to know and who get to know your work, the better off you are. We, uh, okay. Uh, anything else? Um, any, uh, just uh, maybe briefly, uh, would any of you like to comment on tips for promoting your own work so that people get to know you and what you're doing? Going off what Tarek said, uh, this is not a joke. Using social media and in a thoughtful way to promote your work, I think is invaluable. Um, I'd say the last five publications that have come out with my name on it, I posted them on Instagram, like on stories. I've had other spine surgeons retweet them. Um, I've had like chairmen at other institutions repost them uh, with their residents doing journal clubs on them. So I think, you know, obviously you have to do it in a thoughtful way, you have to be appropriate, right? Um, but don't underestimate the value of social media, um, especially in neurosurgery. There are neurosurgeons with tens of thousands of followers on Instagram that have their own TikToks, et cetera. And uh, I'm saying, I mean, we're millennials, right? This is how our generation is going to communicate. It's not going to be through paper books anymore. So understanding how to use the medium, I think is really important. I think doing it in a thoughtful way, people, at least in my field, have been very successful. And I think doctors in other fields as well um, one of my college roommates is now an influencer who's EM trained, um, and he's on a bunch of podcasts, um, and he publishes a lot on social media about different critical care topics, EM topics, and he's amassed a huge following through it, which has led to him getting multiple fellowships and even job offers halfway through residency. Thank you. Thank you.
So, you know, we can do it. It's very powerful. It's more powerful than any one publication you can put out. So it's a good thing to keep in mind. I think we'll be even more prevalent in the next five to 10 years. Any other comments about promoting your own work? I'm sure we'll have more discussions about this in, in future sessions, but I'd like to uh, thank our panelists for participating and all of you who took time out of your schedule to, uh, to be here um, in person or uh, virtually, and we'll look forward to future sessions. So thank you and good night. <laughs>